I just want to try this one time. He is risen. He is risen that was awesome. <laughs> From Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day, rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. And they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, your son, Jesus Christ, has risen. He has risen indeed. And I pray that now as Pastor Trent brings the word, that we would receive this word with faith and love, that we would store it up in our hearts, we would practice it in our lives. I pray that if there is one here who is struggling in their faith, who is skeptical of all of this, that, that the scriptures call the foolishness of the gospel, that it is hard to believe. I pray that you would implant that belief in them and that you would renew that in us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Just because something's hard to believe doesn't mean it's not true. Take Adams, for example. In order to get a sense of the size of an atom, the basic building block of the universe, if you think of an atom as being the size of a baseball stadium, the nucleus of an atom is the size of a peanut. And the rest of that atom is mostly just made up of empty space. Now, if you were able to remove all of the empty space from an atom, and if you were able to remove all of the empty space out of all of your atoms that comprise your body, you would be able to comfortably fit inside a speck of lead dust. And if you were able to take out all of the space out of all of the atoms that comprise the entirety of humanity living on the earth today, we could all comfortably dwell inside a space the size of a sugar cube. It's hard to believe. But it's true. You couldn't lift that sugar cube. But you would fit. And so would all of the rest of us. Or as we continue to think about atoms, let's think about numbers for a moment. Scientists estimate that the number of atoms that comprise our universe on the low end of the estimation is 10 quadrillion vigintillion. <laughs> Which I had to practice saying a lot. It doesn't come out of my mouth very frequently. That's the low end estimate. The high end estimate is that the number of atoms that comprise our universe is 100 quadrillion vigintillion. A difference of 90 quadrillion vigintillion, but <laughs> who's counting, right? Now, as high as that number is to imagine, get this, the number of possible moves on a chessboard is even higher. Hard to believe, but it's true. I see you Googling out there. Let's move on from atoms because those numbers are beyond our ability to really comprehend. And let's just think about a piece of paper. A simple piece of paper is about 0.1 millimeter thick. 
And if you fold a piece of paper in half, that's 0.1 millimeter thick, all you math people out there, how thick is that paper after you fold it? 0.2 millimeters thick, right? Fold it a third time and it becomes 0.4 millimeters thick. Fold it a fourth time and it becomes 0.8 millimeters thick. After four folds, the piece of paper is still less than one millimeter. But if you were able, and you're not, but if you were able to fold that piece of paper 46 times, the width of that piece of paper would stretch from here to the moon. 273,000 miles, more than 273,000 miles. Now, if you try to do that in the course of this service, you'll get to seven, maybe eight, and that's the end. But if it could be done, that's how wide, how thick that piece of paper would become. Let me give you just one more. (laughs) If you decided in the course of your life, or if you decide that you're not going to have children, you will be the first person in your direct line for the entirety of human history to have made that choice. All of your ancestors to the very beginning had children. You will be the very first one in that line. It's hard to believe, but it's true. The story that you just heard Pastor Chuck read from Luke chapter 24 is a story like that. It's hard to believe, especially if you're hearing it for the first time. What, you're saying that a guy was dead, he was in a tomb, and then he wasn't? He rose? It's hard to believe. I agree. And so do the people who were in the story. But the fact that it's hard to believe doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means that it's hard to believe. Now, sometimes when we think about the biblical characters in a story like this, we say, you know, these people, we really shouldn't believe what this book has to say about this. The book is, you know, it's pretty old. And at the time that it was written, at the time these events occurred, you know, people were basically like cavemen. They didn't understand that dead people don't rise. They probably thought this kind of thing happened all the time. And, you know, basically they weren't as sophisticated as we are today. We know that dead people don't rise. They didn't. Well, this is a common historical fallacy to think that somehow people are more sophisticated today than they used to be. The fact of the matter is that Jewish people and Romans in the first century perfectly well understood what you perfectly well understand, and that is that dead people don't rise again. And we know that they didn't believe that dead people rose again because even though Jesus said he was going to rise again, the very people who knew him best didn't believe that he rose again because dead people don't do that. Their witness in this matter is incredibly important because we are taking their word for it. It's one of the things that we are basing our faith on is the eyewitness testimony of the people who knew him best. And what you need to understand about those people is they did not believe he rose from the dead initially. Something happened that moved them from a place of not believing that dead people can rise to believing that at least Jesus rose from the dead. And we're going to look into a little bit over the course of the next today and the next two weeks, how it was that they moved from unbelief to belief. But as it stands, we're standing outside of a tomb that on Friday contained a man who had been crucified on a Roman cross and placed there hurriedly before the Sabbath came. But why was he there? In order to understand that, we need to go back in the story just a bit. So for those of you not familiar with the story particularly, let's go back to the beginning. The Bible tells us on its very first pages that God created humanity and all of the world and everything in it. And he created people to live in, uh, in a harmonious life-giving relationship with him and with each other and with all of the rest of creation. And he gave humanity his law. And the purpose of that law was to continue preserving the harmony that existed between God and people, people and people, and people and the rest of creation. We well, don't have to read very far in the Bible to discover that very quickly humanity broke God's law. And consequently, the harmony that existed between God and people and people and people, people and creation, it was broken. Sin is what it's called, separated us from God, from each other, and from all of the rest of creation, and plunged us into, even all these many years later, the world of 
of misery and suffering and pain that we see so evidently around us today. Not only that, but this action of rebellion against God that our first parents did and all of us have participated in down through the ages, including you and me, it was not a amoral act. It was a moral act of rebellion. Therefore, God is the just judge of the universe must judge this rebellion, this rule breaking, this law breaking of his moral universe and bringing everything into the disaster that we frequently experience out in the world today. So the question is, how is God going to be able to save his people? Because the Bible tells us he would have no delight in simply destroying us to rid the world of evil. The question is, how is he going to destroy evil and save his people in whom evil dwells? Well, that leads us to another miraculous event. The Bible says that the way God was going to do this was that he himself was going to come in the flesh as a new representative for humanity. Where the first representative failed in the Garden of Eden, the second representative would succeed. God himself would take on flesh and dwell amongst us here on the earth. He was born in a town called Bethlehem, right near the city of Jerusalem, still there today. So was Bethlehem. He would rise up and his first 30 years would largely be something nobody paid much attention to. But in the last three years of his life, people began to sit up and take notice of this man who was teaching things they had not heard and who was doing things they had not seen. And it was evident that the power of God was upon him. And then after demonstrating perfect compassion, perfect love, perfect wisdom, he came to his own people and the Bible says they rejected him just as they rejected God and as we've all done. And they handed him over to the Romans of the day who crucified him on a cross on that first Good Friday. It was the most horrendous act of human injustice ever. But the Bible gives another perspective on it as well. And the other perspective on it is, even though it was the most unjust of human actions, through this, God was actually satisfying his perfect justice. When Christ died on the cross, the Bible says he, Jesus was dying for the sins of his people. So that the evil that so characterizes us could be forgiven and removed and properly judged in Jesus. And so that we who trust in him could experience the gift of life eternal, which looks like a restored relationship with God, with humanity, and with the rest of his creation. So Jesus died on the cross, and no one, mostly nobody, disputes this fact. But if that's all Jesus did, we wouldn't be here celebrating today. Because if Jesus just died on the cross, then the very best he is, is an example for us. And many people think that that is what Jesus is. He's simply an example. He's an example of selfless love, of self-sacrifice, of love and compassion and all those things. And he is an example of all those things. But the Bible claims more than that. The Bible says that Jesus not only died on the cross, but on the third day, he rose again. And because he rose from the dead, it was a cosmic declaration that God accepted his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. That he had no sin of his own, therefore death couldn't hold him, so he rose again from the dead on the third day. And that means that those who've put their trust in him, not only are their sins forgiven, but they too will rise from the dead on that last day. So this resurrection story matters a great deal. In fact, the Yale scholar, Yaroslav Pelikan, was not exaggerating when he said, if Christ is risen, nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, nothing else matters. This matter of the resurrection is the ultimate matter. And therefore, what you believe about it is the most important thing about you. Therefore, we're going to look into why it is that these people who were there at first did not believe it and how it is they moved to believe it. And what I want to help you see today is that the very fact that they didn't initially believe the story 
should become part of the foundation of your own faith in the truthfulness of the story. How is it that we see that the very first disciples, the people who knew Jesus the best in all the world, how is it that we see that they did not believe initially he rose from the dead? Well, first of all, we see from this story that the resurrection of Jesus was unexpected, even though it had been predicted. The resurrection of Jesus was unexpected, even though it had been predicted. What we read in verse one is that on the first day of the week, these ladies go to the tomb. Their names are Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, and Joanna, and there were several other women who were with them. And on the very first day of the week, they were carrying spices with them to go to the tomb. Now, let's just think about our own situation for a second and ask ourselves this question. If I go to a graveyard, why am I going there? You may be going to the graveyard because you want to pay your respects to a loved one. You may be going to a graveyard because you want to spend some time in reflection upon the life of somebody who meant a great deal to you. You may be going to the graveyard to reflect on your own mortality and the fact that you too will be there someday. There are all kinds of reasons why we might go to a graveyard. But one reason why none of us go to a graveyard is to see if anybody's risen from the dead. <laughs> you never go there wondering if today might be the day you'll see somebody come up out of their tomb. Because we understand people don't do that. Dead people stay dead. And these first century people understood that too. This is not new. This has always been. So they were going to the tomb, not expecting that Jesus was going to be risen from the dead. And one of the reasons why we know that, not only just because dead people don't rise, but because they were carrying spices. And what was the purpose of these spices? Well, the purpose of these spices was to help cover up the smell of a dead decomposing body. They went to the tomb fully expecting what one would expect when a dead person has been placed in the tomb, that that process of decomposition will have begun. And since Jesus' body wasn't able to be properly buried because it was buried in a hurry on Friday before the Sabbath, they were going to finish the job and surround him with these spices that will cover the smell. They did not believe that Jesus was going to have risen from the dead, even though he had predicted it. And this is what we read in verse two. When they got there, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. The way these tombs worked is you'd have a carved out place in a rock, you'd roll a heavy stone over top of it. And the reason for the stone was to keep animals from getting in there and grave robbers and so on from getting in there. The purpose of the stone was not to keep dead people from coming out. Nobody thought that was going to happen. It was to keep people from getting in. And so they found that that stone had been rolled away from the tomb. And then verse three, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So what were they thinking when they got into the tomb that had been opened and Jesus wasn't there? Well, let's put ourselves in their, in their shoes for a moment. Imagine a loved one of yours has died and you've put them in the care of the funeral home. And you go back later to help prepare the body for, for an open casket, say. And when you get there, you can't find the body. What do you think in that moment? Is your thought, I bet they rose from the dead. <laughs> of course it's not. You get there, you're perplexed. You're like, where'd they move them to? Who took them? Where did they put them? And that's precisely what the ladies are thinking when they get there is who took his body? And where did they take it? And why did they take it? What's going on here? They were not thinking, oh, I bet he's alive. It's not what they were thinking. In fact, it took an angel to interpret for them what happened. Verse four, while they were perplexed about this, standing there, looking around, asking themselves the question, Where did, who moved the body? Behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. They're looking around. He's not there. Two men in dazzling apparel, probably angels as from the other accounts, appear and tell them 
you look surprised. Don't you remember? This is exactly what he said he was going to do. He had predicted it. And yet still for these ladies, it was absolutely unexpected that he actually meant what he said. Because dead people don't rise again. They weren't silly. They weren't unsophisticated. They weren't stupid. They knew that dead people don't rise. They didn't believe it until they saw the body was gone. And then they see this appearance of these angelic figures telling them that he's not there. And then they remind the ladies of the fact that this is exactly what he said would happen. He would first be delivered. He would then be crucified. And then he would rise. And now they're starting to think, maybe the impossible has happened. It's hard to believe, but maybe it's true. The second way we see that the witnesses didn't originally believe what happened is the fact that the resurrection of Jesus was not initially believed, even though it was reported by multiple reliable witnesses. So as we continue reading through the story, after the ladies hear this, we read in verse 9, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Now the ladies are specifically named it was Mary Magdalene. It was Mary, the mother of James. It was Joanna and, and the other ladies with them. Why is he talking like that? Because the people reading this, they knew who those people were. The, the first disciple, the 11 disciples who were there, who heard the report, knew these women. We know that these women are the reason why Jesus and his disciples could travel around for three years, not working jobs that paid any money because they were financially supported by these women and others. They were godly women. They were trustworthy women. They didn't, weren't prone to hallucinating. And so they show up, this whole gaggle of them, and they tell the disciples what they saw. The tomb is empty, except for some angels who told us that this is just what Jesus said would happen. He would be handed over, he would die, and he would rise again. Now, did the disciples say, of course, no, they heard these trusted women, these reliable witnesses, and they thought it was an idle tale. They did not believe them. Why? Because they knew as well as you know that dead people don't rise again. They didn't believe them. And maybe that's where you're at today still. You're here because of tradition. You're here because a friend brought you. You're here because I don't know why, but you're here. And you are in that same place where you say, this is just a bridge too far. <laughs> Dead people don't rise again. Listen, I don't blame you. The very people who knew Jesus best, who walked with him for three years, who saw the miracles that he did, who heard the things that he taught, who heard him predict that he was going to die and rise again, they didn't believe it either and they were there. So you're in good company. But one of them, one of the 11 who remained, Peter, there was something about Jesus's life that was just compelling enough. There was something about the way he taught. There was something about the miracles he saw him do that at least gave him a little bit of doubt about his doubts. And he needed to investigate the matter further. And we read in verse 12, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened. We're not told that he believed after he went and looked. But he marveled. It seems to indicate that he started to think maybe something was going on here. If you're one of those people, like the first disciples, who don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, I just want to invite you to take on the posture of Peter. To consider the things that the Bible says about Jesus and his life and his ministry. To consider the fact that some 2,000 years later, billions of people gather every Sunday to celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And, and allow this to be at least enough evidence that maybe the friend who brought you that you have some level of respect for. To say, maybe like Peter, I should look into this a little deeper. To, like Peter, go to that empty tomb, as it's described in the scripture, and 
and to stoop down, to humble yourself at some level. It's, it's humbling to look into this matter that you know is impossible because dead people don't rise again. And, and it may be embarrassing. You can imagine Peter was taking a risk here to run when everybody else was sitting around saying, these ladies are crazy. And Peter ran to the tomb to see if it's true. Because if he goes there and it's not as they say, he's gonna look like an idiot. And everybody's gonna laugh at him. If you're interested in looking into this more, I wanna invite you to come back for the next two weeks, just two weeks, to stoop down and to look into this and to see if whatever it is that moved the people like Peter and the other 11 disciples to go from a place of not believing to having so much conviction that Jesus rose from the dead that they spent the rest of their lives traveling the known world proclaiming this message. And all but one of them dying a violent death to proclaim it. It's true that if your friends ask you what you're doing next Sunday and you say, I'm going back to church to look into this matter of whether Jesus rose from the dead, they might laugh at you too. You might feel silly. But I would contend that this question is worth looking silly over. To investigate this is worth maybe feeling like a little bit of a fool on the other side because that professor from Yale was right. If Christ is risen, nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, then nothing else matters. Will you come back for the next two weeks and investigate the matter further. There are some of you here today who maybe you didn't believe, but you realize as you hear the story again about what Jesus did and maybe this account, you say to yourself, you know what? I can remember sitting here and not thinking any of this stuff was true, but today something's different. Today, for the first time, I actually believe that this is not only possible, not even plausible, but actually the truth that Jesus did die for my sins, that he did rise again on the third day. Listen, we understand that it feels like that's crazy. Like it's a foolish message. The Bible itself describes this message as being foolishness. It's hard to believe, but it's true. And believing it will not only change your life, but your eternal destiny. For those of you who've come to that place, who believe that message today, Let me just share with you what the scripture says about that. The apostle Paul, who also spent his life proclaiming this message, said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will experience everything that Jesus died and rose to accomplish and to give you as a free gift. And I'm gonna lead us in a prayer now. And if you would like to make that confession, to receive that gift of salvation, I invite you just in the quietness of where you're sitting to pray that along with me. I invite you all to bow your heads as we pray. God, I acknowledge that I am part of the problem in this world. I believe that Jesus Christ came into this world to save people like me that he died on that cross those many years ago to take away my sin and that he rose again on the third day that I too can rise and walk in a newness of life today and life forever with him. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for giving me the gift of your Holy Spirit, your very presence to live inside of me now and forever and help me from this day forward, to learn what it means to walk in your ways and to walk in them. In Jesus' name, amen.